Hi, everyone. And on behalf of the USC Institute on Inequalities and Global Health, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to this exciting and I think quite timely talk from Dr. Jen Cates on what it's going to take to distribute a COVID vaccine in the US. And I, I thought I wanted to say a couple of things about Jen Cates before we start. She's Senior Vice President and Director of Global Health and HIV Policy at the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation. And she oversees all of their policy analysis and research focused on the US government's role in global health and on both the global and domestic HIV epidemics. And she also serves on many federal and private sector advisory committees on global health and HIV, including the NIH Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council, the CDC HRSA Advisory Council Committee on HIV, Viral Hepatitis, and STD Prevention and Treatment. And together, we sit as members of PEPFAR's Scientific Advisory Board. And I guess on the more human side, what I want to say is that over the last 15 years or so, actually, we have served on several committees together, and I've seen her in a lot of different settings. She's thoughtful, she's brilliant, and she knows when to push and when not to, and that's really an art, and she's really amazing in, in that way. And so, quite honestly, there's probably no person that I trust more to be thinking honestly and ethically. With that, Jen, the floor or the Zoom link, whatever you want to call it, is yours. Great, thank you so much. It's it's really good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, it's it's great to be able to talk about this, especially the day before the election. Uh, what happens tomorrow will have significant implications for what I'm going to talk about today, um, I think. And uh, I also was listening to you talk, just give me my, my official bio, and I feel like my official bio needs to be changed to she works on COVID-19, because that's pretty much what I've been doing <laughs> since February. Um, Anyway, it's good to be here. And what I thought it would, would be helpful is I, I was going to lay out some, some my own thoughts and from some work we've done at, at my organization on broad differences between uh, what the Trump administration has done on COVID-19 and what a Biden administration says it would do. Just because I think those um, broad differences help frame how to think about um, everything that's going to happen, whatever the result of the election is tomorrow. Then I would uh, look specifically at vaccine related challenges, distribution challenges, and then go back to sort of wrap it up with say, okay, so what does this mean for uh, the results tomorrow? So um, we have done, if anyone's quite, if anyone's interested in this, we have a lot of materials uh, where we've delved into differences between um, the Trump administration and the Biden campaign on what they have or what they would propose to do on COVID-19 on a range of topics. Um, and some broad differences that I think are the most important to understand the, so it's their, their approaches and their differences. And, and just to start with the, the, some important things that the Trump administration has done. Um, they have, of course, declared lots of uh, public health emergencies and other kinds of emergency declarations that um, enable uh, authorizations to occur and mobilizations to occur that under normal uh, circumstances when we're not in a public health emergency, the federal government can engage in. So I think that's really important to say they have done that. Um, some have said they haven't done it sufficiently, but they have done that. They've also, um, uh, uh, Congress has passed um, uh, COVID relief bills for major bills that the president has signed that include, you know, trillions of uh, relief support and different kinds of money and provisions to address COVID uh, in the United States as well as around the world. So those are, those are you know, really important things to note. But then beyond that, there's some, the approach that this administration has taken, there are a few things I wanna highlight. One is the administration has um, basically delegated to the states and local authorities, most of the responsibility of the COVID-19 response. Now, um, generally speaking in public health in the United States, we have federalism and there's always a, a division of labor between the federal government and the states and local authorities. However, in a pandemic, in an emergency, when um, you're dealing with a, a uh, infectious disease that spreads across borders and doesn't care about uh, who has what authority, um, the federal government does have the ability to play a much bigger role. This, the administration has chosen not to do that in many ways. They have, uh, whether it was testing or contact tracing, a little less so for the vaccines, but delegated most of the responsibility to states to figure out what to do. That's one. 
to the administration, um, at least the, the White House in particular, has at many times you know, questioned the science, questioned the public health expertise, questioned the facts. Um, differently than you know, someone maybe working in science might question things and what are we learning, but really question the evidence and called, called it into to doubt. Um, and that has played a role in um, how the public has interpreted the severity of COVID-19 and, and what the public should, should know, what they know and what they should do. That has really affected it and led to uh, a politicized response. It has become a politicized uh, pandemic um, in, in the United States and um, polarized in the sense that the administration has, has sort of put the emphasis on the importance of uh, the economic the economic recovery as the main motivation for uh, what it's choosing to do, not the health uh, out changing the health outcomes. Um, so question the science and politicize the response. The other thing that this this is not specific to COVID per se, but it has real implications. The administration is is challenging the Affordable Care Act, and uh, is seeking to overturn the Affordable Care Act. There are many things that that would do that could affect, would affect the COVID response. It would, would undermine a lot of the ability to, to, to respond to COVID. So that's just important to put out there. And then lastly, the administration has, um, and this started before COVID, but has really been a, mar a, a feature of its response, has decided to kind of go it alone, has not, has not participated, is not participating in the global efforts that have been set up by most other countries uh, ha has chosen not to engage in that global response in the way that the United States usually does. Now that's been publicized mostly around its critiques of the World Health Organization and its um, statement that, it, that it's ending funding for WHO and pulling out of WHO, which is true, but it also has not been engaged in some of the major global initiatives. And in the past, that was a, a thing that the US would have been involved in. So broadly, you know, um, delegated to the states, most of the authority, question the science and the public health uh, expertise, politicize the response, um, is challenging the ACA and has reduced uh, its engagement with the, with the world on this. What Biden has said um, he would do if he were president, he would put the federal government in charge of the response, meaning, yes, there are certain things that the states have to be in charge, have to determine, but strong federal leadership uh, on on the very challenges that have that have we've all lived through would be a key feature of his response. Where instead of delegating the responsibility to the states, the federal government would have the responsibility for organizing the response, for um, managing the response. Second, he has talked repeatedly about the importance of putting scientists and experts, public health experts, up front. That that would be the voice and the guide of uh, a response of a Biden administration. Um, third, he has talked about how uh, it, you can't really say you're either going to focus on economic recovery or public health recovery. They both go hand in hand. And so the, just the um, determining factors to get the economy back on track, to address the challenges that people are having in their everyday lives are dependent on addressing the health problem. So that's, that's a very different uh, message or approach. And then fourth, um, going to the ACA, he has talked about uh, uh, building on and strengthening the ACA. And of course, he, he when he was uh, vice president to President Obama, was helped create and pass the ACA. And then finally, a Biden administration would, would seek to re-engage with the world on COVID and sort of has said that they would be want to be a leader on, on the COVID response internationally, which would include rejoining the WHO, um, being part of the international initiatives, that are trying to work together to, to, to manage what is a global pandemic and not, not go it alone. Um, at KFF, one of the things we, we've done, we always have been doing, it's a part of our work, but we've done it during COVID is uh, tracking public opinion. And it's just interesting, I was gonna highlight a few um, findings from our most recent survey that was in the field this month, actually October, we're now in November. Um, and, uh, and it really drives home both how concerning COVID is to most of the public, but also the partisan divide that we have over a public health problem. Um, first, uh, when we ask people what their biggest concerns are right now, the economy tops everyone's concern, but it's followed by COVID. 
but there's a split. If you um, look at Dems versus Republicans versus independents, you see a different pattern. So for Democrats, the number one concern is COVID. The number two concern is healthcare. For Republicans, the number one concern is the economy and the number two concern is the criminal justice system and reform. And for independents, the number one concern is the economy, the number two is COVID. So you really start to see these differences play out. We also found that um, two thirds, so 66% of adults say they're worried that they or someone in their family will get sick from coronavirus, which is an increase from just a few months ago. But this, when you break it down by party, by partisanship, twice as many Democrats as Republicans say they're worried. Um, and it goes on and on. We've seen this on our surveys where uh, you ask people about face masks and there's a partisan difference in who says they wear, wear face masks, how regularly they wear them, whether they think they work. Um, interestingly, when we ask about trust in some of the key scientific institutions like FDA and CDC, there's, and Tony Fauci, there, there's generally high levels of support across the board. There's slightly higher levels among Democrats, but there's still pretty high levels of support. So now going to um, vaccines. Uh, that's, I'd say the, vac the push for a COVID vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine is one area where the Trump administration has gone in much bigger and has um, really, uh, the administration has played a, a stronger federal role. Um, big federal push, to, on, particularly on the R&D side. So Operation Warp Speed, which you may have heard of, which is the federal government's initiative to mobilize with the private sector a quick response. And for those of us who've been working in HIV for many years prior, you know, now and prior to this, it is a very rapid response on the on the vaccine side. It's it's kind of unbelievable, and I think will help change the way vaccine R and D is done in the future because it's it's been um, so it's they've been able to uh, speed up in many ways um, the process and forge alliances across companies that usually doesn't doesn't happen. Um, However, oh, and the administration also uh, with Congress, because Congress has, has provided funding for this, advance purchased millions of doses, um, many million, hundreds of millions of doses with the idea that those, those doses would then be able to vaccinate most Americans, um, hopefully. Um, they've also begun to start on planning and have sent um, planning, uh, interim planning playbooks in a sense to states. But states are going to be, again, states are going to be the entities responsible for figuring out the vaccine plans. I, I've been reading through them. There's, you know, 51, if you include DC, vaccine plans from each state. Then there's uh, vaccine plans from some local governments. The tribal communities have vaccine plans, lots of different vaccine plans. It's going to be different all over the country. Again, in a pandemic, that may not be the approach that works the best. So we looked, we recently did an analysis of the main challenges that we see on the distribution side. So this would be once a vaccine or vaccines are approved, is approved, what do we see as the big issues that, um, that have to be addressed? I'm gonna run through them here. Um, one big one is funding. So I mentioned that the federal government has advanced purchased hundreds of millions of doses, which is really important. What hasn't yet happened is the provision of funds to state and local governments to distribute vaccines. And if you think about it, um, what we've seen over the last, what's come to sort of be seen by, by America in a way that I don't think has been as visible before is that public health in the United States is chronically underfunded. So the amount of support that, that state and local health departments get is, is not, it's not been enough for years. And when COVID-19 hit and you had a confluence of Event, a, a situation where, in addition to underfunded health systems, um, where states were saying, we, we don't have the capacity to test, we don't have the capacity to contact trace, we don't have labs, we don't have what we need because we've been underfunded, we're not getting the money. The state revenues went down because of the economy shocks. And that was a, a, a double whammy because that's also a source of funding in addition to the federal government for states. So for, for vaccine distribution, um, very little money of the money that's been appropriated by Congress to respond to COVID included money for states for vaccines. And so far, only 200 million has been given to states for this purpose. That's not a lot of money for, for this 
this uh, enterprise. Um, California, just because you're all in California, uh, got the most it's population size based. Popu uh, California, I think, got 20, about 28 million um, for vaccine distribution. So the states are really saying, they've said to the federal government, we don't have what we need. And in fact, it's been estimated by Robert Redfield, the head of the CDC, that at least six billion is needed. And other estimates I've seen go as high as eight or 10 billion for this purpose. So funding for vaccine distribution by health authorities is one, one challenge. Um, and the prospects for that uh, a fifth relief bill are slim right now, will not happen until we're not sure. The second um, area that I think is, is concerning uh, are, is on the supply logistics and monitoring side. This, so the US uh, has routine vaccination is you know, part of what is done every year um, uh, by the federal government and the states. Um, and there's actually been some experience with um, dealing with a pandemic outbreak, H1N1 in 2009, and, and there was sort of a, a trial run but the sort of magnitude of what we're dealing with here is a whole different enterprise um, because we're talking about uh, likely needing to vaccinate most of the population and vaccines that are much more complicated, meaning there might be needs for cold chain storage, um, multiple doses, um, uh, tracking uh, a whole com a complex system. It's, it's an undertaking that has not been done before. Uh, in the United States, and so it it is going it itself that that the act of of managing um, supplies, logistics, and monitoring is going to be very challenging. Another issue, and I mentioned this earlier, is there the sort of who has authority over what splits out differently. The federal government has some authority, states have different authorities, and the local governments sometimes have a different authorities. And there's a lot of outstanding questions about the relative role of each of those. So one issue, for example, is vaccine mandates, and um, that comes up a lot. Those are state determined, and it's unclear to what extent they, they could ever be federally determined, but would states go that step of mandating that certain populations get vaccinated with co for COVID? Unclear. Could the federal government do something to encourage vaccination? Um, for example, conditioning funding on vaccination uh, coverage. Um, these are unknowns and um, run smack into existing challenges around uh, vaccine skepticism and anti-vax kind of mood of uh, do not have any vaccine mandates, that's not what we want. And so that is going to get, I think, potentially tricky. But states also have the ability, and they've done this, they did it during H1N1 and are starting to do it now, of um, authorizing additional types of providers to be vaccine administrators. So that's another issue that has to be looked at. How do you encourage uh, states to do that? The federal government actually is moving to do more of that so that more and more of the workforce, the healthcare workforce can vaccinate. Another issue that's going to uh, come up is insurance coverage and out-of-pocket costs. This is one where the, the federal government and Congress in particular have uh, through legislation um, taken steps to address uh, what generally in, in vaccine, um, for routine vaccination, there are gaps in, in some of the coverage to uh, try to ensure that no one is going to face out-of-pocket costs for a COVID-19 vaccine. And in fact, uh, a rule that was just released last week um, by HHS went even further to ensure that. So this is one where I think there's still some gaps, but it, it is being addressed. They are being addressed as much as possible thus far, um, largely building on the ACA but trying to provide uh, ways where Medicare, Medicaid, the private insurance market for sure are not going to be charging people for COVID-19 vaccine and are moving, are developing a way to um, address this for uninsured adults. Uh, kids, there's actually programs for kids. So that's, that's one to watch. Another challenge is, as we've seen with many epidemics in the United States and this one too, is the the very deep disproportionate impact on racial and ethnic uh, minorities in this country of COVID-19, of complications for COVID-19, and how that gets dealt with, how, how vaccine is equitably uh, allocated, distributed um, to uh, people of color, given, given the, the deeper, the much more severe impact, coupled with um, already more challenging issues around distrust, concern around the medical establishment, 
many which are go way back and are based on actual, you know, very uh, detrimental experience is going to present a whole range of other challenges for uh, communities trying to ensure that there's uptake of the vaccine. And then related to that is the final point I wanted to make on communication and trust. And so what uh, the federal government and states are able to do to um, communicate about what a COVID-19 vaccine is and isn't, what it can do, how strong it is, how reliable, you know, all of those things and um, combat misinformation is going to be one of the biggest challenges because we're already seeing that, um, that as an issue, as a big, a big challenge. And in fact, states in their, in their vaccine plans have been asked, all of them have to report out what their communication strategies are going to be and how are they going to address this because it is such a huge issue. Um, so having said, you know, laid out kind of some big differences between Trump and Biden in general, and then some of these big issues on, on vaccine distribution, um, I was thinking today, you know, what happens tomorrow if Trump is reelected um, and what happens if Biden gets elected? Like, what will this mean for vaccine distribution? And, and these are just some of my thoughts, um, we'll see. But if, if Trump were to be reelected, I, I think one question I would, I'd have, I mean, up until now, the administration has put a lot, has bank, is banking on saying there's gonna be a vaccine available. And, um, and that's been a key push. In fact, to the, some would say, instead of other things, you know, sort of throwing their hands up and saying, we're not gonna, you know, we're gonna just focus on a vaccine. And um, to the extent that that was politically motivated, because it, it's important, you know, what does that mean if he gets reelected? Does the urgency to push for a vaccine um, stay? Does it diminish? And then the other thing that, that people have, have raised around the Trump administration's approach to vaccine is the um, concern that there would be political interference with the, with the scientific process. I don't know what it means for if there's a re-election, if that gets worse or, or not, but it does, it does raise the question of, when of when, whether some of those guardrails that are being put up will, will hold. Um, so that, that's another issue. Um, and the other, I think another question is how much will the federal government really push as a leader on the vaccine response? So will some of the issues, will the issues that I laid out be left up to the states for the most part to, to deal with, or will the federal government step in and, and keep, continue to play a big role? So to me, those are some big questions if Trump were to get reelected, but we don't know. There may, they, they could stay the course and, and really push on vaccine. If Biden um, were to be elected, I think the most immediate question that I would have is what happens during the transition period? That period, you know, we're in, we're going into winter, we're going into flu season, we're going into the moment at which a vaccine is likely to be approved and states are developing their plans. And if he's elected and you have a, uh, the outgoing administration sort of decides to not help with that transition on the, on planning, that could really be a challenge. I'm not saying they will, but that has been raised as an issue. Plus the challenge of it's hard enough when you're um, uh, in the transition team going into a new administration, but having to do that in the middle of a pandemic um, is a whole other game. And then of course, um, once he's there, we you know he's laid out what he's going to do, but there's going to have to be a lot of ground to make up, I think, in in building trust and um, and you know sort of maybe changing course a little bit. And at the end of the day, regardless of who gets elected. Um, one of the limiting factors will be science in the sense that we don't know what vaccine we're going to get. We don't know when it will be approved or authorized. And we don't, you know, we don't know how effective it's going to be, if it's going to um, require two doses, if it's going to require something the following year. So to some extent, science and our ability to discover is going to limit this as well, um, in addition to politics and, and all the other things. Um, so having laid that out, I, I I'm going to stop and I look forward to your questions that I hopefully can answer most of. I'll try. Thanks. I, I, I appreciate that. And, and, and everybody, the floor is open for questions. I have a couple here that I'm just going to start with just to kind of okay. start the ball rolling. And, and thanks for that. Um, you know, I guess my, my biggest question comes back to the politics because there's no way to stay away from them. And when you talked about if, let's just say, if, if, we, if there is a Biden administration and if things move to a federal level response 
And then there's this question in terms of the states who at this point have been so much on their own. In this politicized moment, what's your sense of how things are gonna play out like in, in that transition? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you can, you can see it playing out in two different ways with lots of permutations and, and places in between. But in, in one scenario, you could see the states kind of saying, great, you know, <laughs> we, fine, let's put aside, you know, this is a crisis. We, are, we need to get beyond this and we need a vaccine. So we're working together and, and, and some of the, you could potentially see some of that stuff fall away. You could also see some states that are um, Republican led sort of digging in their heels and, and saying, we're not gonna, um, we're not going to follow. And, and that would be detrimental because we, we need to achieve a certain level of immunity in the, to make this work. And so if we don't have enough people getting vaccinated, it, it's not going to work. Um, I do know that the, uh, all of the states and all the governors have, have jointly through the National Governors Association actually written to the federal government saying, we need more help, we need more, more input. Um, and with many of the states now, particularly those that weren't as aggressive maybe in the beginning, seeing rising cases and stress strains on their hospital systems, maybe. But I, it's a very, it's, we don't know. And it could play out in, a, in, in whether it's actually the leadership of, of, of government in, in those states or individuals fearing that there's their um, ability to make their own health decisions is being taken away or whatever that could be a real risk uh, to everybody. And I, I don't know the answer to that, but I agree. It's, it's, yeah, it's I, mean, I know you don't, but it's just, it's still like, it's kind of like that. Yeah, no, it's really, it's concerning um, that this has become so politicized. Um, so I've got a couple of specific questions for you. So in, 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 because you have your ear to the ground, I mean, how soon do you think that actually a vaccine is gonna be ready for people to be distributed? Yeah, so what I, my, my understanding is that um, the earliest that we'll probably see an authorization, so that would be like an emergency use authorization, which I'm happy to talk about, or an approval, maybe the end of this year, maybe early next year. And then what's going to happen or what will likely happen is that they, the distribution will start for the sort of frontline workers, the, the, the healthcare workers and other first responders who are the essential, essential workers who are out there every day who are putting themselves most at risk, they're going to be prioritized for a vaccine. By the time, um, and there's phases, there's a phased approach that's been laid out by the federal government and that all states are, are focusing on a phased approach. By the time the average, you know, we get a vaccine, I mean, there, there's going to be prioritization based on first responders, on people that are uh, uh, most compromised health-wise, it's going to be potentially into next summer or beyond before we're seeing widespread distribution. That's my, my perspective on it. Um, I'd love to be wrong. I actually would. I, I say, I'm going to say it's uh, uh, hopefully in mid 2021 or a little later. And if it's sooner, that's great. That'll be one I'd be happy to be wrong on. But I, it's hard to see how that is going to happen in a rapid way, given the challenges I laid out um, and, and all the, the issues that we're aware of. So it's going to be a while. It's going to be a while. Yeah. And, and so what happens to ongoing vaccine trials once the first vaccine is approved? The question asked from an ethical perspective, yeah. can they still be tested against placebo? What are the implications for creating a range of effective vaccines? Yeah. So one of the um, issues that has come up, it, it's really about, so the, the, controversy that has been talked about in the, in the press and, and is this issue of like, will there be an emergency use authorization or an approval? Now, an emergency use authorization is a, when, the, when the FDA has not um, formally approved something for use and said, we're, we're licensing this product, um, whether it's a treatment or a vaccine or, or, or a test, that the, the data are good enough to give them a belief that it's it, we want to get it out there for maybe sometimes for specified purposes, um, they can issue an emergency use authorization. The challenge of and that that has some benefits because you can more rapidly get something out, particularly to those who need it. The the challenge is you first of all don't have all the data in that you might want to ensure the the, the full clinical trial results um, are giving you all the data that can tell you how 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 
effective it is, essentially. Um, and the question that's come up is what happens to that particular trial if you have an emergency use authorization? Because do, do you keep the individuals in the trial afterwards? Do you give them the, the vaccine? Will they stay in the trial? There, I've seen there's not necessarily a clear guidance on it and there, uh, a clear decision on it, but FDA has said to manufacturers in its emergency use authorization and approval guidance that it is calling on them to find ways to continue that trial um, because it's so important to know. Whether, what that means for the other products and the other trials that are going on I think those are going to continue because it's not a given unless unless the uh, we there's a vaccine that comes out it's like this vaccine is 90 percent effective and we have no issues with it great but I, I you know we're gonna i think there's going to be a need to continue the trials to to look at multiple uh, there's multiple candidates and we'll probably be continuing to understand what works best so so there's some related questions i think to, to that point i mean and so so one of the the questions is at the administration level and thinking now in terms of more the Trump administration, but with this pivoting away from science-based responses to COVID uh, messaging, like the elevation of Scott Atlas to the task force and the recent condemnation of Fauci, um, are you confident at the federal level that uh, science-based messaging will be, accompanied, will be accompanying the vaccine rollout? Like how, how do you see that? Like how will the vaccine in, in the kind of Trump world, how will a yeah. vaccine rollout take place? Yeah, so if, this is if, a, if Trump's reelected. Um, it's uh, I, Yeah, yeah, and then I have another thought, thought on that if he's not. Um, but if he is reelected, I think what's concerned, first of all, I think the agencies, the FDA, um, in particular NIH, they're very, and CDC are, are going to put out science, sci they're gonna focus on scientifically sound approaches and, and messaging as, as what they'd like to do, whether, what the federal government, like as a as the government launches as a communication campaign, I think that's a little uncertain. Um, and uh, what we've seen over the last many months is when there has been scientifically based guidance, there's been contradictions of that information from the top. Mm -hmm. And that would be the that would be very unfortunate. And so uh, I think of another concern is what it is what will be the extent of a campaign from the federal government on vaccines, how strongly will it be followed and pursued so that you, you have, you know, we have, we have this weird situation where you have some people say, if, if there's a vaccine under a Trump administration, I'm not gonna take it. I don't trust that. You have other people saying, you know, I'm not gonna take a vaccine because I don't trust vaccines and I don't trust Fauci, you know? So you have these like the opposite perspectives coming to a similar conclusion, neither of which is, is based on probably the right decision making. Right. And um, so who the messenger is and, and what they say and how consistent that message is is going to be the whole ball game on this. And I think there is a risk if, if, um, if we have a vaccine, for example, that is not highly, is effective at the level that we would all, I mean, the FDA has asked, has said 50% at least effective is what they want, at least 50% effective. If we have a 60% effective vaccine, how do you convey to people what that means? Um, and that's hard. And if you have uh, uh, somebody, a high level government official, basically calling into question, vaccines don't work, you know, maybe, oh, it's not really good, that would be bad, or acting like it's going to cure everything or fix everything, neither being, being accurate it is a risk. And we've seen this with some of the dialogue around various treatments being, we're gonna push through that we're gonna have an authorization for treatment A or treatment B that had to be pulled back because it's not really effective. Mm -hmm. And that's created a lot of confusion. So um, those are concerns. The other thing I've heard, and I, I, I don't, it's just something to think about is if uh, Biden wins, um, will Trump or some people from, the, from the, the former administration publicly question the vaccine outside, from the outside? And what would that do? So I think there's a lot of unknowns on this. Um, we, because we've seen in our public opinion polling, um, two, two big things I want to say. One is a lot, Amer almost everybody in the country experienced this pandemic. I mean, you know, at, at such a high level, like when we've tested, when we've asked, you know, 
almost virtually everyone was in a lockdown situation or, you know, uh, having to take some measure. So usually that phenomenon doesn't happen at such a large scale. And a lot of people still remain quite concerned about their own personal safety and that of their people they love. So there is concern. And I think there's people, more people take this seriously than not, for sure. And more people want a vaccine than not, for sure. So I think, I think that that is, is there. We also have seen how partisan battles on this have influenced public opinion. So the we've seen increasing shares, increasing divergence between on, on like face masks and other social distancing views by party over time based on that larger political dialogue. So it really does matter what is being said and who says it and who the messenger is. Yeah. So a kind of a slightly different tack now, but you know, one of the things that we've all all been concerned about, and again, it comes from another question here, is about vaccine safety, right? And one of the things that's nice, is, yes, things are moving quickly, quickly, but obviously there's concerns in terms of moving so quickly. And like, do you think that there are concerns around safety and that are heightened in this particular moment? And what are ways of thinking about ensuring vaccine safety for real, as well as in terms of messaging? Yeah. So, I mean, I think what what's happened most recently is FDA has really um, they put out pretty strong guidance around uh, what it will and will not accept and has sort of reinforced its stated um, position that it is making a decision based on the scientific evidence and is going to have its vaccine advisory committee make a recommendation, which they don't, they don't have to necessarily take. But so point being, I, FDA has in all of its signaling um, in, indicated that they are following all of the protocols that you would need to follow on this front. So I'm, I honestly, I'm not worried, me personally. I, I, I feel confident in that process um, or knowing enough to be able to watch that process to, to you know, I'm not, well, I feel confident in the process in two months, but I feel confident in the process right now. And all, um, and, and there's a post, um, once there is a vaccine, there's a safety monitoring process that continues on. And all the states are going, are being asked and are going to have to be monitoring adverse events and other issues. And in fact, the um, part of the reason the, the vaccine timeline has, has, you know, when the president was first saying, we're gonna have it before Thanksgiving, we're gonna have it by the election, we're gonna, it slowed down because FDA basically said, we're not going to um, entertain um, the any kind of authorization until you've had two months of data to, sh to look post reaching certain endpoints on 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 safety and other things. So I I think that there's not at this point I don't see any additional if, if those processes are followed as they are laid out I feel like that is what needs to happen and that would be appropriate. That, that's a relief, actually, right? When we think about kind of the politicization that's been yeah. happening around all of these. So that, that's actually really good to hear. Yeah. Um, another kind of, again, slightly pivoting question, but you mentioned that you looked at the vaccine plans across a bunch of states, right? So when you looked at them, do any seem particularly more equitable than others in terms of who's going to get the response first? Are there lessons to be learned for how it is that they're constructed? Yeah, so it's really interesting, and we're going to be writing some of this up. But we, um, so we we have plans from every state in DC, um, there, except actually every state in DC were required to put in a plan. We have plans from all of them except DC and Delaware, and I forgot what have not publicly released their plans. So those two have not, and then a couple other states have only released a very short executive summary. But most of the states have released their plans. So that that's good, um, and uh, the this was a, this was based on CDC basically saying here's the interim playbook that we are giving you to follow, and you respond based on this what your plan your interim plan is. It's draft, so they it was very clear this is your first draft that's going to change. They're varied. I mean, some states are much further ahead than others and um, have much more sophisticated systems in place to not you know sort of monitor the response uh, get sign up vaccine providers to, to be able to deliver the vaccine and, and, and um, provide, administer the vaccine. Others are still, you know, we're still figuring this out. We're still getting together our networks. But I'd say the states have been working on this. None of the plans are, are starting from scratch. They are all 
in various stages of, of putting together as much as they can, not yet knowing what the vaccine itself will be, because that's a big part of the what will determine what they do, not having a lot of funding to do this um, yet. Uh, but in terms of the equity, so they've also all been asked to, um, they, they're using the inter the framework that's been laid out. So the, the way that the, uh, the allocation is going to be set, how, how the vaccine is allocated, there have been two main processes. The National Academy of Medicine was asked, was commissioned by the NIH and CDC, I believe, to, to have an expert consensus panel come together and make recommendations for how to equitably allocate a vaccine. And so they put out some general guidelines. And then ASIP, which is the uh, Advisory Committee for Immunizations that is federally set up to advise CDC and say when it thinks a vaccine um, is, should be uh, provided, approved, put it on the vaccine list, is going to come out with its, based on the National Academy of Medicine's framework and the actual characteristics of whatever vaccine is approved, they're going to come out with their own, with a, uh, uh, the final sort of allocation recommendation. So you know, first responders should get that, that kind of thing. Um, states have been given those, that preliminary framework and are asked to say, how would you allocate? And so what I've seen in the plans is that they're all basically following that, that, that framework. Um, some have talked a lot more about uh, racial, and, uh, racial and ethnic populations, tribal populations and equity, and some have a much more explicit equity, uh, uh, social equity and uh, um, framework in, in terms of how they're approaching everything about their vaccine plan, whereas others do not. Um, so that, that does vary, but they, are all, they are, have all been asked to think about this in phases, uh, several phases. Phase one is the sort of frontline responders, phase two. And they've been asked to think about it as, what if you only have a limited number of doses? What if you then have more doses? What if you, so they, they are being asked to do that kind of hard process, but the plans, I'd say every single state has said, this is our, this is a draft. Okay. okay. We're not ready. We, and what, just out of curiosity then, what is the process then? So they're drafts and then what's the process of approval? So CDC and HHS are reviewing them. And then they're going to give feedback to, to them. And then they're going to be submitting the fine, I, I, whether it's final or, the, or like the working document that they'll be using that may change in the future. But they're, being, they're under review at CDC now, or maybe HHS. Um, so uh, having read them all, they are not political documents. They are public health documents. They are about, for the most part, they are really about what the state is trying to figure out in terms of, you know, how does it do this? How does it do this? Very unprecedented thing. That, that's super helpful to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, now let, let's turn to the ideally, hopefully, again, to another question, ideally, hopefully, a Biden administration, if I can say. Um, you know, what steps do you think a Biden administration could take to reduce the extent to which COVID vaccines becomes, and, and vaccines in general, are such partisan issues? Are, do any of the state level plans try to address partisanship in any way? Is there any kind of framework that's trying to move us beyond that already? Yeah, I didn't see, I didn't look, we have a team looking at the plans and nothing in the plans I reviewed said anything about that specifically, but they did all talk about trust, public trust as a key factor in success of, of, of a vaccine um, and addressing misinformation, but really about uh, uh, how they, they have to all consider and are considering how to instill trust in a vaccine. And without doing that, you know, that will jeopardize success. Um, a Biden administration, I, mean, I, think, I think what um, has become, you know, what, what's been fascinating and also, um, you know, scary to some extent if you have a uh, if you have a president and high level officials changing questioning the science it really does impact people's perceptions and their willingness to do things so if there is a biden administration and they and and as he has said he would is puts out public health expertise and is consistently talking about messages and and probably would require i mean i would think um having some high profile, if possible, high profile um, public type events with governors from the different states 
to talk about the collective importance for the United States of doing this. That may start to, that will, I think there's a, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of people out there who are really concerned and want a vaccine, and so that gives them that kind of confidence, but pulling others in who say, okay, we're maybe, maybe this is a different approach. Maybe we're really, it's all, it is all about um, how do we protect the United States and, and get ourselves back. So those are the, I think those are the kinds of things that could happen that could make a difference. Um, uh, that sort of uh, really a bipartisan approach to, to, you know, just this bipartisan approach. We're in a national crisis. It requires a bipartisan approach and spokespeople should be from all across the, the spectrum. That um, makes, sorry, go ahead. Finish yeah, no, that's, that's, that I think could make a big difference. So there's a couple of questions that talk about our, our relationship with other countries. So I'm going to yeah. maybe, okay. So one of them has to do with the way that the pandemic and politicization is happening here. Um, what it's going to mean for other countries, like particularly countries in the EU. Do you think that um, vaccines are going to end up being distributed there to their populations maybe sooner, maybe more effectively? Um, that, you know, what do you know about kind of what's happening over there yeah. and if there's anything to, to share? Yeah, so I mean, I th one thing that's that's occurred that's a bit of an alarming global trend, or a trend around the world, is is this sort of vaccine nationalism uh, approach. So the U.S. has sort of advanced purchased lots of doses to basically say we're going to make sure we get ours first, and many other countries have done the same thing. And so what we know in many of in the EU, we know what that means is that people in low and middle income countries are going to lose out, and they're not going to. So that that's one issue. Secondly. Um, is how is the process going in other countries that maybe haven't had, uh, that have had more unified approaches to the COVID response? Um, I, what I would guess, because I, those countries have had uh, better success, even though there's, there's resurgence now, better success at organizing testing and contact tracing across, you know, across the whole country and more uniform messaging around um, I mean, the UK is going into, has just gone into a modified lockdown, and that was a, uh, a uniform that came from the you know, prime minister, and, and they, they basically said that. Hard to imagine that happening in the United States, but you can, in, in different countries where you have national leadership saying, we're doing, here's the vaccine, and this is what we're doing, and people are more accustomed to accepting that, and, um, and they also are, they might, I mean, one of the challenges I think we have in the U.S. that is not um, going to be experienced in many of the other countries that we might think of as peers, is we have such a decentralized system of health, um, which is not a political, it's not a partisan thing right now, but that's just our heart, that we have the, such variation. And in other countries, even in ones that are federal systems like Canada, in Canada and Germany, they have done a much more uniform job still of uh, responding um, in a uniform way. And, and I think countries that are able to do that with a vaccine will be in better shape than countries that are relying on 51 plus approaches. So that, that, that is, um, and when, when you have greater shares of the population trusting in government and trusting in science, that will make a difference. I mean, one of the um, interesting things on, on face masks is you see in some cultures, uh, face masks are just have, oh, have, were already um, socialized as, as an intervention, particularly in, in some Asian countries because of their prior experience with outbreaks mm -hmm. and, and the intervention itself being accepted and not questioned, um, combined also with a very different orientation around what people believe government's role is. So I think countries that have that, those kinds of different relationships will, will see a better outcome, could see a better outcome. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that maybe, I mean, you didn't quite frame it this way, but maybe one of the positives that's come out of what happened with the Trump administration around vaccines is that it may change R&D for the future. Um, and, I, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit more to that and in terms of yeah. kind of what you see might be some of the changes in, in, the, in the good. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, no, I think, it, um, you know, the traditionally vaccine R and D. This takes a long time, right? It's it's a long process, um, and um, and it's not necessarily one that's done um, collaboratively between con uh, companies. And and um, in this particular case, uh, the combination, sort of 
the, the federal government's um, financial ability and, and scientific um, knowledge and other mechanisms combined with industry's willingness to, to sort of participate created um, a much more rapid, and not just in the United States, I mean, around the world, the, the collaboration that has, that has occurred to speed up the trials and to coordinate what is being learned and how the trials are being done to um, not to cut corners, but to do things in a, in a different way within the scientific process. Uh, um, and certainly this is not my area of expertise, but from an outs a little bit of an outsider looking into that, it seems like there are incredible lessons to be learned that could be um, applied to other areas going forward that can expedite the process in new ways and, and will be very beneficial um, to, to, to everybody. And so uh, sort of the, the post, analyzing that and figuring out what, what can be, you know, what's, what was just due to the emergency situation and what is really better ways of doing this um, will, will, could be very beneficial to, to the world for sure. Yeah. yeah. I hear you. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Kind of what we learned from HIV at, at one point. I mean, it's just totally kind of, kind of the amazing. lessons, the lessons are, are, have HIV changed the way a lot of institutions did things. And though the benefit of that is now feeding into this, and this is also going to change the way the future scientific enterprise is done in, in areas as well. Um, so, so that's a good thing. So I have a couple of different questions and I, we're, we're, we've got a, we got a couple more minutes. So I'm going to try to okay. take them individually because they're, they're kind of different. So I'm not going to give okay. them to you all. So I'm going to just give okay. them to you all the time. Okay. So, so if you were to be able to wave a magic wand, you know, what are the steps you think are needed to determine which are the populations who should be the first to receive the vaccine? Are you comfortable with the ways in which things were set out? Does it make sense to you how this has been structured? Yeah. Um, so as I said, the, the National Academy of Medicine has laid out um, its, its broad framework and, and, and the, they had, you know, very, they had a, a diverse panel of experts on that. And it was, it's, a, as you know, these are non-political processes. So it was, it was a, a, a rigor, as rigorous as those things can be to kind of look at it. Um, and I, I, in general, I think the, the end result that they came up with is, is reasonable and makes sense for not necessarily yet knowing the actual candidate of, because the, the, the reason that's important is um, uh, you have to look at everything around the, the, the vaccine that was approved, that gets through first, who was in the trial, where, you know, what do we know about the effects of, of what, who is, you know, who, just how representative was the trial, et cetera. Um, so that's one. And then, um, you know, in addition to first responders, you really have to, have to think about if there's limited doses, what's the right way to do this? And this, this is ethics and this is, um, but so if I, I guess if I could raise a rate, you know, wave a magic wand, I would, um, I would probably take a similar approach and, and really focus on, on the people that have been putting their lives at risk on a, on a daily basis, much more so than I have. Um, and uh, and that's uh, providers, healthcare providers, um, first responders uh, in in very you know uh, fire fighters, etc. Um, people that come into contact with people that need help on a regular basis, um, potentially teachers. I mean, the 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 people in the population who either don't have a choice about what they're putting themselves at risk, or that's part of their job. That's who you really want to reach first. Um, uh, especially if you assume that that's where transmission is more likely to occur because you're trying to interrupt transmission too. Then you want to kind of go out and say, okay, well, we know that certain groups um, who are uh, become infected are more likely to get quite sick and die. So you want to protect them. So you kind of do it that way. I think what's some of the un open questions are kids. There's not a lot of kids. Only one of the trials has children and it's 12 and old, older. And with the data th thus far saying that kids in general appear to be to they don't get as they don't get as sick some kids get very sick some kids die from from COVID-19 but much less a less lesser rate um, it's not as deadly to kids thank god as as many other populations and the trials aren't being done on kids yet in a big way they may not be vaccinated for quite a while and that may that may that probably is the best way to approach this but I don't think that's going to Oh, 
it'll it'll raise other challenges. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, and and you know that raises kind of a different point from from one of our our other questions here, which is, you know, with such a focus on vaccines, and if we do start to move towards a different kind of and a better sort of reality, how are we going to keep people adhering to other prevention behaviors once a vaccine is approved? I'm glad that question was asked because that's actually I do I should have said that I do have a big concern on that because part of what we believe is going to be the case is between the the likelihood that the vaccine that we get isn't, you know, isn't going to be 100% effective, you know, that would be, um, or even as high as it would, um, and it's going to take a while to get to everybody who needs it. Um, we are still going to need face masks. We are still going to need social distancing. We are still going to need testing. We are still going to need contact tracing. Things that have have not worked yet. They're just not. I mean, they work. Meaning, when face masks are used it reduces COVID incidence significantly when social, you know, all of these things we know are very effective, um, but we haven't successfully deployed them in the United States in many places because um, of lack of uh, support to do it, because of politics, because of a whole host of, of reasons, because some places have mandated vac uh, face masks and others haven't, because some, in you know where I live, I can get a test. Right now, I can just go get one. I don't need a doctor's note. I don't need an appointment. I maybe need to sign up right when I get there. Easy, not hard. There's very little barriers to doing that. People in other places, lots of barriers to getting testing. Um, and that's that's one of the challenges we face. We're not. There has been no way to manage supply and demand in the right way in this around these issues. Um, and because we will still need to be doing those things for quite a while, if people let their guard up, if once a, if that that will be, you know, the um, disinhibition, as we know from HIV, if people think, ah, oh, I, I can I can let up because of this, that will be very very dangerous. Yeah. This is our last our, our last question, which is when you think about us at USC and you think about us, and in terms of you think about individuals, but also in terms of academic institutions, is there a role that you see in particular that you think would be helpful for us to be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, one of the um, amazing things of all of this whole experience, and, and this was a question somebody asked me when I was presenting a couple of weeks ago, and I was re been reflecting on this, is, you know, um, uh, have, what has this done to scientists and to academics and and you know, with all of this attack, I said actually, I think we've been more connected than ever. And I think the 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 academy and um, and the science, this sort of scientific community, has been at the forefront of studying all of these things that are just so critical. Whether it's um, acceptance of certain interventions in communities and how what what are the sort of correlates of acceptance of whatever face masks, um, or if it's analysis of you know. Um, County comparisons of county across counties to understand what factors might be ex explanatory and why they've had some have had outbreaks and some haven't, or it's um, some of the actual genetic uh, tracing of the of the virus. All of those things are are really coming out of academic institutions and are invaluable. Um, people in the people who are informing those who are making policy decisions are using that information. So I my my Plea is to to do those analyses and do those those studies and help um, help everybody understand what didn't go well and what has gone well and what what needs to happen going forward for sure. There's a huge role for that. Thank you. And you know we're out of time, and so I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I'm so sorry you're not visiting right. here, but so glad you did. It this. looks very nice. I it looks warmer than where I am, but thank, thank you, thank and thank you everybody for for joining us and take good care. Okay, all right, okay. take care. Thank you. Bye.